Our next honored speaker is Hanjo Kim. He is my dear friend from HSS. He's not only a good speaker, good surgeon, very active in society, and he always surprises us with some new technologies and events. I'm struggling to get my patients out of the hospital seven to 10 days, and he's talking about ambulatory surgery, adult deformity practice. Uh, let's see what he's gonna bring out from his head, what type of rabbit is gonna come out. All right, thanks for the opportunity, and I'm honored to be one of the honorary lecturers. Uh, debt of gratitude to Chris Ames and Vidat for having me here year after year, after year, despite all the horrible talks I give every year. But anyway, today I'm going to talk about uh, optimizing value in adult spinal deformity surgery. Here are my disclosures. So, um, you know, we, we all know this information. Adult spinal deformity surgery is pretty expensive. This is some of the papers uh, from some of the uh, faculty we have here in this room. But um, in 2013, the cost of adult spinal deformity could have ranged anywhere from thirty-eight to $55,000. And today, it's probably somewhere around fifty to 80000 and then some data suggests that the index surgery could cost X, but the revision surgery could cost half as much or even more. And um, if we look at some of the uh, metrics that they utilize to look, look at the cost variation and quality measures, you break it down based on things such as patient age, um, socioeconomic status, as well as insurance type, uh, what we see is that uh, there's a three times difference between those patients who have a length of stay that's less than three days versus greater than six days. And that's a 3x difference, anywhere from 25000 to uh, over $70,000 for uh, some of these operations. Now, this was a review of 55,000 uh, what they called spinal deformity operations, but in reality, not all of them were all spinal deformity. They were just uh, greater than four levels of fusion that were uh, collated through the database. If we look at some other things that predict the cost effectiveness of adult spinal deformity surgery, it's not only length of stay, but it's also uh, larger fusions. So patients who had greater than eight levels of fusion, if you did anterior as well as posterior surgery, some of the data that was uh, presented uh, previously, as well as patients who had high EBL. And to, to a certain extent, these things are all related to each other. Um, but if we're talking about value and increasing the value proposition for adult spinal deformity surgery, we have to keep this uh, equation in mind. And actually, Dr. Sethi is going to give a talk a little later. I think he's coming in via Zoom, but, and he'll go into this more. But value equation is very simple. Increase the quality, decrease the cost, and you make your value proposition much, much better. And how do we do that for adult spinal deformity patients? Well, you could avoid adverse events. Uh, you could minimize your implant costs. And then there's a bunch of other things that you could do to try to improve uh, the outcomes for these patients uh, and measure them the right way. Also, ensuring that surgery is truly indicated versus those in which uh, they may not be. So if this is the uh, direct cost and quality gained curve, uh, you can see that it's sort of everywhere. And what we want to do is try to get to this area. And how do we do that? We started this process at HSS back in, I think, uh, 20... Uh, uh, 16 to try to look at this retrospectively. And we compared uh, basically surgeons who had approached deformity, adult deformity surgery with lateral and open posterior approaches versus a, another surgeon who had just done all posterior approaches. And we looked at data from 2013 to 2016 to see uh, what this would look like. Uh, we looked at uh, patients who had greater than five levels of fusion, an LIV that went to S1 or the ileum, and a UIV that went to uh, lower than T8, uh, all adult deformity patients. We excluded three-column osteotomies, prior fusions that had greater than two levels, just to try to keep the data set somewhat clean, and neuromuscular cases such as Parkinsonians or patients with MS or other issues. Um, and we did a propensity match analysis to try to keep the data as clean as possible. You can see here uh, the propensity matching worked out pretty well. And no real difference in the complication rates, but we weren't really powered to really look at that. What we wanted to do is look at the quality, look at, look at the quality and the cost and the value proposition. So here's the data. When we looked at open posterior with lateral interbody approach, the average length of stay, so this is a subset of patients, by the way, from 2013 to 2016. The data is a little bit different now, but just to say, this is, this is sort of telling a story of, of how we got to where we are today. So a lateral interbody with open posterior approach, average length of stay, almost 10 days. Uh, the open posterior at the time, it was about 5.8 days. 
uh, and also 40% had gone to rehab versus 25%. So that's an added cost if you think about length of stay and where the patients are discharged to. If we look at surgical variables, you can see that you're fusing a little bit more in the all open posterior approach, but the surgical time is uh, just about 120 minutes less, so almost two hours less of operative time. Uh, the blood loss was uh, less, but not significant, uh, but the transfusion volume was less. So you're, you're transfusing about a third less in these patients when you're doing all posterior versus a combined approach. If you look at implant use, okay, you're using more pedicle screws because you're fusing more levels in the all open group, you're using more pelvic bolts, uh, likely because you're not having inner body at L5S1. Uh, and also, uh, but if you look at the cost of the lateral inner body cages, there's none used in the all open posterior approach as opposed to uh, three and then uh, the uh, occasional A-lift that's done as well. So uh, that comes down to uh, also then biologics, and, and you're using more BMP in the all-open posterior group, uh, perhaps more allograft, which is relatively cheap, uh, uh, but more DBM in the uh, uh, combined groups. And then if we combine implant costs and biologics only, not including the length of stay cost, what you see is that if you have a lateral approach with an open posterior versus an all open posterior with the same rate of complications, demographically the same patient, you're going to spend about 30% more uh, for, that, for that operation. And that's not including the, uh, the length of stay data that I was talking about. So the question is, if you have a patient like this with a degen scoli pattern, multi-level stenosis, some sagittal plane issues, would you do this operation that's two hours longer, the length of stay is up to four days longer, and the cost is 30% more. Or would you rather do something like this uh, where you could save a lot of time, potentially save some money, and you still achieve solid fusion? This is a CT scan that was done eight months post-op and you could see no issues and no rod fractures in that particular patient. So when we started this journey and we started to look at elements of this, we wanted to look at length of stay. And why length of stay? Because of that reference I uh, showed you in the very beginning, where that was the cost variation was the largest. If you could bring your length of stay down to less than three days versus six days, you're gonna already save three X on length of stay costs. So we wanted to see what factors were associated with length of stay uh, in this subset of patients. And, and then we looked at only the open posterior patients because we decided that that was actually the group that was gonna be more cost efficient and have a better value proposition. Things that affected length of stay were EBL, length of the procedure, when the surgery was done, so that was very interesting, the temporal, the actual time the operation was done, no matter how short it was, uh, the ICU stay, as well as the day at which the patient was mobilized first after surgery. And that data helped us to get to something called the enhanced recovery pathway that we uh, did within our system at HSS. And we looked at four major elements of the pathway to help us make things uh, more efficient and to perhaps improve the quality uh, that we could deliver for these types of operations. So one thing that we did is to try to control EBL, we had a dedicated anesthesiologist or an anesthesia team that we worked with for these operations, controlled hypotension during exposure, um, as well as uh, having relaxation so that the muscles aren't fighting you on exposure, and also having a, a spine fellow or a senior resident as your first assist. For operative time and how to save on operative time, we had also, again, the uh, dedicated anesthesia team as well as a surgical technician, uh, a four-stage surgery approach where everybody in the room, including the circulating nurse, is aware of where you are in the operation, and then attending being present for closure, which I know is not very common practice, but I found that you could actually just shave, shave, shave off 20 minutes in a case, especially with an exposure from T10 to pelvis by being in the room. We avoided ICU stays totally. For, so you notice initially we excluded the three column osteotomies or the VCR type patients, but these are the typical degen scoli T10 to pelvis type of person. Uh, and we basically said they could, if they need uh, some monitoring, they could just stay in the PACU overnight. Let's try to avoid the ICU stay. Hospitals that specialize in periop care for this patient and is gonna clear this patient for surgery is aware of all of their uh, 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 medical issues that need to be addressed. And then early mobilization. Uh, so not only did we use Toradol, so that was based on a randomized control trial that we published uh, looking at IV Toradol, basically demonstrating that it did not affect fusion rates with two year follow-up. And we used dexamethasone somewhat uh, judiciously. Uh, we also started an early diet for these patients. 
And these patients were mobilized on post-op day zero. So after they get out of the operating room, they get out of bed the same day, uh, and they're mobilized three times a day instead of a prior protocol that was utilized, which is only mobilizing twice a day. So these are some granular elements of the pathway. You can see uh, in the publication, we go into a lot of detail about that. But basically what we found is that in order to do a prelim power analysis on, on these patients, we needed 26. And when we got to 20, we wanted to do a prelim analysis looking at these patients, and we matched them based on one-to-one uh, uh, -one on, on a bunch of demographic data, and we compared patients who had this pathway versus those who did not on a historical cohort. Again, they were well-matched based on the propensity analysis. And you can see here, these are some of the changes that happened just by instituting some of the changes that we were talking about. So about a 500 cc decrease in your blood loss. Uh, we were faster in the operating room. We, had, we brought our ICU length of stay down to zero. So a lot of the times you're in a general hospital, the culture is to say, well, you know, there was an eight level, six level, seven level fusion, this patient's gonna go to ICU, it was sort of dogma. But you, you could really try to avoid that uh, if, if you say, well, you know, the blood loss was 300 cc's and the surgical time was only four hours. Really, this patient may not need to go to the ICU. Then we also instituted a culture of early mobilization at HSS, which was initially hard to do because the therapists and the nurses in the recovery room are not used to it. But we were still able to sneak by with having at least 15% um, of the patients mobilized on post-op day zero and then 85% definitely on post-op day one where they were taking at least a minimum of 30 feet worth of steps. So that's what we mean here with compliance in regards to early mobilization. And through all this data and the, comparing those who did not have this pathway versus those who did, we were able to bring our length of stay down uh, by almost four days. So it's about three and a half days from 7.3 7 to just about four and a half. When we looked at 90-day complications and readmissions, they were not different between the historical cohort versus the enhanced recovery cohort. And about pain-specific uh, pathway adherence, the majority of them were able to be off of their P PCA by post-op day two, which is pretty standard. And I could say this is somewhat historic data from 2018. Now it's even more aggressive, and definitely the, the education around opiate use, usage has uh, definitely aided in that. And using... Um, IV dexamethasone uh, on post-op day two. So midnight of post-op day one onto post-op day two is usually when we give that dose because many of us, you'll see when you round on your patients on post-op day, post day one, they're still in post-anesthesia bliss. They feel great. They say, wow, it wasn't so bad. Post-op day two, they have a ton of pain. They start taking a ton of medications. And then post-op day three, their abdomen's huge. And then they say, well, I haven't passed gas that delays their discharge by a day or two. So changing some of these pain protocols to ensure that they do not have that pain spike at that time, they're not taking more opiates at that time with the uh, IV uh, decadron as well as the Toradol, which is uh, given standing, has made some of the difference in regards to this. So what we found is that basically, if we instituted some, some of these pathways, you could actually just have a reduction in your cost uh, by 20%. And that's not including the the implants, as well as uh, the other elements, such as the operative time, which is expensive. So here's a case example. Uh, this is a 69-year-old, and this is some data that's more present, some more uh, uh, present-day case examples. 69-year-old, so, uh, typical patient, 50% back pain, leg pain. We may see these patients in clinic. They have foraminal stenosis, uh, 4551. A lot of them may also have a 45 spondy in the setting of that, and then they have some uh, modic changes, as well as some foraminal stenosis in the concavity of the, of the lumbar curve. And so this is a typical case. I just kind of copy and pasted a screenshot from the medical record. Uh, so you could see a typical case like this. You start at 8.51 in the morning and you're done at 12.15. 400 cc blood loss. This, was, this case was done in 2021. And I could say that we do have rod fractures, but this particular patient did not have a rod fracture and did well after surgery with this pathway. Um, you can see here the length of stay for this patient was just about three days. Here's another patient, 70-year-old, 50% back pain, 50% leg pain, and also something typical that we see, uh, operative time starting at around 9, 11 a.m. with incision, and then closed with the last stitch by 12.55. So, you know, three and a half hour uh, operation. This patient had a 500 cc blood loss, and her length of stay was uh, three days. This surgery was done, you can see data service on September 9th of uh, 2020, so over three years of follow-up at this point. So some of you may look at these constructs and say, well, how come you're not using antibody? Don't you need antibody for fusion? And I would submit to you that we need to rethink our strategy for antibody, especially if we're trying to think about quality 
and, and value proposition that we're trying to do with these operations. Uh, here's a, 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 a review of a paper that was published from some of the WashU data. They looked at 230 patients with four plus year follow-up. Look at the results. The results say that actually inner body or no inner body, it has really no bearing on the incidence of rod fracture, which I think is very interesting to see. And if you look at um, some of the data in a more granular way, this was the same group. The, the inner body fusion approach, whether it be an A-LIF or a T-LIF approach versus no inner body, it really had no significant difference in the incidence of rod fractures uh, uh, for these uh, subset of patients. That, that was a review of 526 patients. If we look at a meta-analysis, looking at the utility of inner body, we see that actually at five, L5S1, it's not so much the inner body that makes a difference, it's actually the use of pelvic fixation. So this is a systematic review looking at all the pool data of all the publications that have been published on this topic. And you can see here that the, cur uh, the, the dark uh, tri um, tri uh, triangle is actually uh, over towards favoring pelvic fixation more so than the utility of inner body, which is sort of equivocal. The reason why that's the case is if we go back to the biomechanics of pelvic fixation and the utility of this, it's really about the cora and the pivot point. And when we look at that, what you need is you need some support that has to be anterior to that cora, which is in the posterior superior portion of S1 uh, end plate, to support the S1 screws so that they do not get loose and then so that you do not develop a pseudoarthrosis and then subsequently need a revision operation. So if you look at how anterior you could get to the cora, a long iliac screw is probably going to achieve better uh, uh, fixation and protection of the S1 screws than any inner body can do, just because of the lever arm as well as the torque that's generated uh, at that portion of uh, fixation. So I, I would say that biomechanically speaking, you could avoid inner body altogether in L5-S1 fusion if you were to place iliac screws with your L5-S1 uh, fusion. Here's another case, and, and combination of data uh, regarding the sparing use of inner body, which I still use a ton of inner body, but usually TLIF approaches for single or two level disease to try to optimize the alignment. Uh, in adult deformity patient, the only time I use a transforaminal inner body approach is when there's too much bone taken away after the decompression where I'm concerned about the fusion. Here's a case of a 64 year old, 30% leg pain, 70% back pain, has had, had failed all conservative measures for management, some, something similar that we see in our offices. And this patient underwent surgery in April of 2023, T11 to pelvis. And uh, very recent, I bring this up because I feel like the culmination of all the data that we've done and, and the utilization of the pathways has brought us to this, to this phase and to this position. So this patient had a two and a half hour uh, incision to closure operation, T11 to pelvis. Um, you can see the discharge summary here for this patient. She had surgery on 411 and she was discharged the same day. That's not a typo. She was out of the OR by just around 11 o'clock. She was mobilized. She walked with PT at 1 p.m., at 3 p.m., and then 5 p.m., cleared PT, and she went home. And this is very possible in today's day and age with the institution of uh, uh, some of these pathways and some of the techniques. Some of you say, well, she went home and she called you 50 times and she left 50 voicemails to your office. I could tell you that that's not the case for this particular patient. Sometimes I have patients like that, but in this particular case, it was not. You can see... She's two weeks post-op on April 24th, almost two weeks post-op at that point. Her, she's having still back pain, but it's uh, controlled. We send her home on a, a specific PO regimen. But by the time I see her at the six-week visit, which is in May, uh, you can see that her pre-op back pain, which was nine before surgery, is, is now a two. So very tolerable. And I actually recently saw her for her seven-month, eight-month follow-up, and she's uh, doing, pretty, uh, doing very well. She's off of all restrictions at this point. And, uh, and is very happy with the results. The reason why I bring this up and the reason why I wanna talk about this is because if we're not thinking about this now, then we're gonna be forced to think about this. There's evolving healthcare dynamics in today's world. Ambulatory surgery centers are gonna be increasing at least 15% by 2028. And Medicare has started something called the inpatient only list. So they make a list of cases that they will reimburse at inpatient rates for only. And that list is getting really, really small. And in the next three years, they're basically gonna institute 90% of operations to be all done on an outpatient basis. If that's the case, that means that if we do our two level uh, L3 to five fusion for a typical patient and the hospital may benefit from uh, charging whatever they charge for doing that operation, they're only gonna get charged at what the ASC would 
what the government would pay the ASC for that, which is significantly less. How much less? It's almost 100% less. I believe it's 92% less, and that's some of the data that I'll show uh, in a little bit. But if we look at orthopedics and spine surgery in general, um, actually not spine surgery yet, but orthopedics, uh, perhaps the COVID pandemic uh, resulted uh, in, a, in a sort of a, a, a um, faster evolution of of the ASC market in regards to orthopedics because patients did not want to go to the hospital setting to have these operations. They wanted to go to an ASC. They thought that there would be less COVID positive patients in that area. So actually, before the pandemic, uh, orthopedics was a minor player in the ASC market. Today, uh, it's gonna be over 28% uh, of the ASC market and it's mostly hip and knee replacement surgery. I submit to you that actually being an orthopedic resident, I remember in 2006, there was a rich burger at Rush who was doing outpatient total hip replacements. Everybody said he was crazy. He would get up on the podium and he would say, well, to be honest, a lot of them, I booked them as outpatient, but they end up being admitted because of pain control issues. That's in the times when I used to round on my total hip replacement patients in 2006, and they used to be saying at least for three or four or five days. And you could, I could tell you now in the evolution of the last uh, 17 years or so, the majority of now hip and knee replacement surgeries are being done in the outpatient setting. The market drivers for this are clear. There's lower healthcare costs associated with the ASC versus the hospital. There's favorable reimbursement, mostly because of the margins being better, possibly lower infection risk, but I don't think infection risk is that high for this subset of patients. Um, but I think now is a time where hospitals need to be accountable and responsible. They have to work with surgeons uh, and physicians in order to make the, the flow of the operating rooms more efficient. Uh, that will increase quality just because of the fact that we're able to do something uh, uh, in a very reproducible way. You're not going to have, for example, a surgical technician who's doing a cholecystectomy and then coming into your spine room on the break to cover somebody else. You have a dedicated team that the hospital is committed to in order to deliver a higher quality product for our patients. Because at the end of the day, it's going to be teamwork aside from just what the surgeon's able to accomplish by themselves. Also, uh, I think some of the work that's going to be necessary in order to institute this is a change in the culture. Uh, I could tell you that even now today, it's been about three or four years trying to institute some of the cultural changes within HSS, but there's still nurses in the recovery room and physical therapists who are scared to mobilize spine, spine patients that have seven level fusions or eight level fusions uh, early. And it takes time and it takes uh, intake from uh, a buy-in from the C-suite of the hospital in order to push this through. So in conclusion, I wanna say that hopefully some of the things I talked about today uh, will help us to start focusing on quality uh, as well as the value proposition that we could have in adult spinal deformity surgery. And I do believe that one day we'll be doing these types of operations regularly in the ASC. Thank you.